George Galloway, welcome to Primo Nutmeg. Thank you. It's been a little while in the uh, making, but I'm glad to be here at last. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. And, you know, this show really focuses a lot on U.S. politics. You, of course, were a member of parliament for quite a long time, and you recently have launched the Workers' Party of Britain, partially because of this past election and what happened there. But for folks in the U.S., you know, the coverage that we received of the election is that Jeremy Corbyn was just too far left. He was too radical, and British voters rejected this. And that's why Labour received the worst, uh, you know, its worst performance since 1935. So I would really like for you to give the American audience a little bit of perspective. Why did Labour suffer that defeat? Was it because Jeremy Corbyn was too far left or was there something else going on? Well, that hides as much as it reveals. Uh, the Conservative Party vote went up by only 1%. And although Jeremy Corbyn lost 2 million votes from two years ago in 2017, it was still a higher Labour vote than Tony Blair's last election victory, which produced a, a landslide majority, and all of his successors, so Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband, all three of those results were poorer than the result that Jeremy Corbyn achieved in the recent British general election. I'm just trying to put that in perspective. Sure. The, the number of Labour members of Parliament is the lowest since 1935, but that speaks to the vagaries of our election system. First past the post, winner takes all, uh, not so much to the Labour share of the vote, which, as I say, was better than it was in the last four elections, because, of course, the one before this one, Jeremy Corbyn increased the Labour vote by a greater amount than anyone since 1945. So we look for the answer. The answer is, in one word, Brexit. Jeremy Corbyn's election program in 2017, which scored 40% of the vote and a very, very big number of Labour votes, more than 12 million, and the 10 million he got two years later and the loss of dramatic loss of seats that that brought is summed up in that one word Brexit. In 2017, Corbyn was promising to respect the result of the Brexit referendum. In 2019, just two years later, Labour was already in a box marked Stop Brexit. And thus the Labour loss was all in the areas that voted for Brexit. Labour lost 54 seats in England. 50 of them voted for Brexit in the referendum of 2016. So I'm afraid it's the B word rather than the S word, socialism, or rather than the L word, leftism, uh, that cost Labour uh, the dramatic setback that occurred last week. And for US viewers, the, the loss was all in what you would call Michigan territory, Connecticut territory, uh, uh, Pennsylvania territory. The loss was in the industrial and post-industrial working class areas which had voted overwhelmingly for Brexit and rejected Labour dramatically at the recent general election because Labour was anti-Brexit. There were some personal issues. Jeremy Corbyn has a lot of baggage after decades uh, on the far left before he became uh, the Labour leader. There's a lot of videos out there that Jeremy Corbyn would have wished were not there. Speeches with all kinds of national liberation organisations, revolutionary organizations and just wording on those platforms because of course he never imagined he'd be the leader of the Labour Party running to be Prime Minister one day. But the politics, left-wing politics that Corbyn stood for in both elections are just as popular and as necessary as they ever were. 
And, you know, it's worth asking, how did Jeremy Corbyn manage to become the leader of the Labour Party? Because analogous to Bernie Sanders in the U.S., who is extremely popular, there's quite a bit of pushback, you know, institutional. Obviously, they stole the 2016 election from him. Um, and then you're kind of seeing uh, echoes of the, that this time around. So how is it that Jeremy Corbyn actually rose to even potentially becoming the prime minister? Well, entirely by chance and much to his uh, astonishment and uh, probably much to his uh, uh, regret uh, because he just was the next left wing cab of the rank uh, to run in a routine way for the Labour leadership. But in 2015, when his predecessor, Ed Miliband, incidentally, Britain's uh, uh, Labour's only ever Jewish leader, uh, who was rejected by 75% of British Jewish voters, just to put later questions, I'm sure, into perspective, Corbyn stepped forward because he was the last man standing. But right at that moment, there was a total collapse in the Labour Party membership of support for the neoliberal orthodoxy of the Blair, Brown, Miliband era. There was a total rejection of austerity as a political economic tool uh, to resolve the crisis that emerged from the crash in 2008. And suddenly, all the previous neoliberal orthodoxies collapsed in front of his eyes. And he, as the anti-austerity radical candidate, suddenly began to pick up momentum. And my goodness, what momentum it was. He won with 59% of the vote in a five-party race, five-horse race, uh, which uh, was quite some doing and to the astonishment of the ruling class and the ruling elites inside the Labour Party. But there he was, he didn't expect this, probably didn't even want it, knew that some of the baggage he had would be damaging. But there he was, leader of Her Majesty's opposition, go figure. So I wonder if this is uh, a bit more analogous to US politics, just because you know the Democratic Party here, which is supposed to be the left wing party, they were have really been taken over by neoliberals, especially since Bill Clinton in the 1990s. And um, recently with Donald Trump, Republicans have been shifting a little bit more towards right wing populism. Um, is it sort of the same dynamics in the UK, especially over Brexit? Because, you know, intuitively you would think that uh, the Conservative Party would be the one who would be championing the EU and you might be seeing some opposition from Labour. But we saw the, the reverse seemingly. So um, would you say that it's an analogous situation where neoliberals have taken over the Labour Party? Well, uh, that's pretty perfectly expressed, given you're thousands of miles away. That's exactly uh, what has happened. Labour was historically against the European Union, and the Conservatives were mad for it. Uh, it was the Conservatives that took us into the then common market and then deepened that into an ever more NAFTA plus type relationship. Uh, but this gave rise to a division in the ruling class between the globalist capitalist uh, wing and the British localist, nationalist capitalist wing. Uh, if you like, patriotic capitalists versus globalized capitalists. Uh, and that opened the door for the referendum which we had in 2016. Now, Labour backed the EU and most of the uh, now leadership of the Conservative Party opposed it and they won. And so we now have a lot of political cross-dressing, a tremendous amount of political cross-dressing. So uh, the Conservatives are, are the ones questioning the, uh, the theorem of perpetual imperialist war uh, that Hillary Clinton and Tony Blair uh, represented, uh, and the Labour people who are defending Tony Blair, defending the so-called internationalism 
of, uh, of the interventionist wars over the last uh, few years. And so you get Corbyn coming along as a man who opposed all those wars, a man who opposed all that austerity, and he, briefly as it's turned out, ends up as the leader of the Labour Party. The Labour Party will now move back towards Tony Blair because they have drawn the conclusion that it was Jeremy Corbyn and his leftist profile which cost Labour the election. So no candidate as left-wing as Jeremy Corbyn, who, by the way, is He's not that left wing. We're not talking about Lenin here. We're talking about a kind of Quaker, peacenik uh, kind of guy. Uh, but no candidate as left as him will ever again be a candidate for leadership of the Labour Party. All the people now running to be his successor are more or less Blairite. And so that has opened a big political space on the left in British politics, which, as you uh, indicated at the beginning, is something I'm in the process of addressing. So, yes, could you speak about that a little bit? Because um, you recently founded the Workers' Party of Britain. Uh, this, of course, isn't the first party that you helped found. I believe that you also uh, helped found the Respect Party uh, in the previous decade. Um, so could you just speak to uh, you know what the philosophy of the Workers' Party is? Uh, well, the Workers' Party is what it says on the tin. Uh, the Labour Party became even under Corbyn, maybe even especially under Corbyn, basically a collection of liberals who imagined that liberal equals left, that liberal equals socialism. And it doesn't. As a matter of fact, many of the liberal infatuations are core to the reasons uh, why the working class has fallen out of love with the Labour Party. The Labour Party has become a university-educated, metropolitan, uh, really rather prosperous, liberal outfit. And that's allowed, was it, if you'll forgive me this uh, rather cumbersome phrase, this embourgeoisification of labor and the proletarianization of the conservatives, which is analogous to the Trump thing up to a point, uh, has led to this political cross-dressing. So Labour is perceived as anti-national, more interested in globalization, more interested in the EU as uh, the personification of globalization in our uh, region of the world. Labour is unpatriotic. Uh, Labour is against the family, thinks that the family is only one of a number of uh, ways that you can live your life, neither are better nor worse than those. The infatuation with identity politics, where everything is done on racial quotas, sexual quotas, gender quotas, now even transgender quotas. That's the Labour Party. To many working class people in uh, England and Wales, and also to some extent in Scotland, though the national question there skews these things. Well, none of these things have anything to do with socialism. None of these things have anything to do uh, with what I would call an actual left. Socialism accentuates only one identity, class. What is your relationship to wealth and power, to the ownership of the means of production? distribution and exchange. If like 99% of us, you are entirely dependent on your wage and your salary to live, then you are of the working class. And we need unity of all those who depend on their labor to live. And if you begin to stratify, differentiate, uh, different identities, subsidiary identities, you turn parts of that working class against each other. That's a big difference in our analysis. We are for the people with blue collars, whether they have black faces or white faces, whether they're gay or straight, however they're identifying today, 
we stand for them as workers. I think it's got uh, legs. We are a pro-Brexit Labour Party, a socialist party. We really mean it. So I think that, you know, there's a danger of Democrats, um, you know, repeating the mistakes of the Labour Party insofar as they're ignoring what the working class was telling them with the election of Donald Trump, similar to how Labour uh, ignored the signals from Brexit. Over the last three years, Democrats have really been obsessing over Russia. Um, they've really been trying to apologize for Hillary Clinton's loss to a handpicked Pied Piper game show host by focusing on Russia. Um, and I just was wondering, you know, I, I know that this came up a little bit uh, in the UK election with Corbyn and the uh, the NHS, the, the leaking of documents there. Um, so could you speak a little bit about how uh, this neo-McCarthyist, uh, you know, hysteria that's play that's plaguing the U.S. currently, how that also may have played a role in this pre in this election earlier this month. Well, the Russians are everywhere, if uh, you believe the uh, British media and political class. But this time there was another piece of cross-dressing. The British general election opened with Labour accusing the Conservatives of being in the pay of the Kremlin. I know it sounds ridiculous, try not to laugh, uh, having spent a hundred years being smeared as, uh, as uh, quasi-Bolshevik uh, agents of the Kremlin. Now, Labour was accusing the Conservatives of being in the pay of the Kremlin. And as you say, the, the election campaign ended more traditionally with the Conservatives accusing Labour of having come across documents, which they don't deny were real, uh, by uh, virtue of uh, Kremlin hackers, or I don't know, I didn't pay too much uh, attention to it. But the idea that in South Wales, in the north of England, anybody is waiting for a signal from Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin to decide their political next political move, it's so absurd, so ridiculous. I suspect we'll hear a little more uh, of it. Uh, but the the Russians are coming as a narrative. I suppose it's always been with us. It has survived the collapse of communism. Uh, the Soviet Union is 30 years dead. But still, we're on the lookout for men with snow on their boots. So another interesting parallel that we're seeing, uh, you know, even since the uh, the election earlier this month in the UK, is that Bernie Sanders has recently been attacked as an anti-Semite, which is pretty hysterical considering that he is a Jewish man himself. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Jeremy Corbyn was also smeared as being an anti-Semite as well. So could you uh, just give a little bit of perspective on that and explain, um, you know, the, the basis of those attacks? Well, I have known Jeremy Corbyn fully 40 years and sat next to him, literally next to him, in the House of Commons for almost 30 years. So I'm here to tell you that the uh, allegation, accusation uh, that Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite is as offensive as it is ridiculous. And moreover, almost all of the people making the accusation, leveling the allegation, know that. And that's what's truly sinister about this. Heaven and earth was moved uh, to try and stick this tag on Corbyn. Uh, the entire board of deputies, the chief rabbi, uh, the uh, Jewish newspapers, uh, supporters of Israel who were either Jewish or not Jewish, none of that actually mattered in the end were deployed on a on an industrial scale, on a militarized scale, on this anti-Semitism uh, scare. And the fact that they knew it not to be true is much more dangerous, uh, actually, even than the allegation itself, because it demonstrated, if we needed it demonstrated, and many people did actually need it to be demonstrated again, there are literally no limits at all, none at all, that the ruling elite will be prepared to stoop to in order to stop any 
substantial challenge to their power and wealth. And as I say, Corbyn didn't even really represent that much of a substantial challenge. I've been, I was a Labour member for 36 years. I was a Labour MP for almost uh, 20 years before Blair expelled me and I had to run as an independent and win twice. Uh, but I've been associated with Labour for uh, more than 50 years. And I've known lots of Labour programmes much more radical than the one that Jeremy Corbyn was positing at the recent general election. So my point is, if that's what they're prepared to do uh, to crush Father Gapon, uh, what would they be prepared to do to crush a British linen? The answer is they'd do anything. Uh, not short of death, uh, not short of uh, tanks on the street. Uh, as someone, an American, I think, once said, if voting really changed anything, they'd abolish it. Now, um, Bernie Sanders can look forward to the Jeremy Corbyn treatment, not just on the socio-political, economic level, uh, but on this level of anti-Semitism. And don't think for one minute that being Jewish protects you from allegations of anti-Semitism. I'll give you a little longest arm of prominent Jewish socialists who are supporters of the Palestinian people or even just opponents of Benjamin Netanyahu who have been actually expelled, anathematized, driven out of political life in Britain in just the last four years. And they were all Jewish. Go figure. So obviously Bernie Sanders is still being attacked as he was in the 2016 election. But another candidate who is running for president this year um, is also being smeared as a Russian asset. Um, that, of course, is uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Um, she's been getting attacked uh, even since hours before she was uh, about to announce a NBC News article came out uh, using uh, evidence from a company called New Knowledge, which actually got caught creating fake uh, Russian troll accounts or interfering in election and pretending as though Russia was. So I just was interested in um, you know what your thoughts were on Tulsi Gabbard. I know that you've said you're a Bernie Sanders fan and... Um, you know, she, I think, has uh, you know received both praise and criticism on the left. Um, I think there's some competition between her and Bernie Sanders, especially on the issue of foreign policy, a lot of debate there, which is actually a good thing in my perspective. But um, yeah, overall, I just was wondering if you'd heard much about Tulsi Gabbard and if you had any thoughts on her. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I've been, I watch American politics closely. I have a, a, a UK American uh, radio stroke television show on Sunday nights the mother of all talk shows, has a big audience in the US. And I'm on RT America five days a week on Manila Chan's in question. Uh, so of course, I, I pay close attention to what's happening uh, in the US. I, I support Bernie Sanders because he's got the best politics that can possibly win. Uh, there are no doubt people with better politics than Bernie Sanders, but they can't win. Whereas my calculation is that the is that uh, the possibility of a Sanders victory uh, are real. I think he may be the only person who can defeat Donald Trump, uh, and that therefore he's the best. He's got the best politics of any of those who could actually beat Donald Trump next year. Uh, but Tulsi Gabbard has many very courageous uh, positions. Uh, on uh, on the Middle East in particular, on Syria in particular, uh, that she has expressed uh, most uh, eloquently. Uh, she is uh, a good face for uh, the uh, these uh, anti-war, anti-imperialist positions. She has some pretty bizarre views on on India and Modi and the Hindutva uh, fascism that uh, is rising there in India, which is now being contested by millions of Indian people on the streets in various parts of the country. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be too hard on her. Uh, I hope she has uh, an ongoing role in, uh, in American politics. And who knows, uh, her politics uh, might sharpen, might, uh, might become uh, rather more coherent than they currently are. So another issue that I wanted to ask you about is Julian Assange. 
um, you know, who was arrested by British police uh, earlier this year and is now uh, sitting in prison uh, awaiting trial and, you know, potentially um, could face being extradited to the United States and being tried uh, here for releasing documents about um, war crimes committed by the United States in Iraq. I just would like your overall thoughts on you know, what your predictions are for what might happen with Assange. Um, and also if you've been involved in any protests and uh, just, you know, if resistance on a, uh, you know, on a street level might do anything to, you know, sway what the UK and the US are doing with Assange. Well, Julian Assange is a, a close personal friend of mine and I admire him and respect him to a virtually unlimited uh, degree. Uh, his calvary over this last decade has been extremely painful to watch, but much more painful for him to uh, experience and undergo. I have very real doubts uh, as to whether he will survive this whole process. He certainly wouldn't survive uh, for very long in the dungeons of the United States injustice system if it came to that. Uh, but he's, uh, he's in a very bad place. Uh, psychologically and physically, and he's in a very bad place legally uh, because it's abundantly clear uh, that they are determined to get them. They are determined to get their man. They are, <coughs> they are going to uh, do whatever is necessary to have him extradited. The legal case for his extradition is so threadbare as to be ridiculous. First of all, uh, the uh, category of political uh, accusations, political uh, convictions, political accusations and charges is specifically excluded in the 2007 extradition treaty between Britain and the United States. I know that because I was in Parliament doing everything I could to oppose that extradition treaty. And I personally received assurances from the ministers concerned that I was worrying unnecessarily because this will never affect any political prisoner because political crimes are specifically excluded in the extradition treaty. And I see that Julian's legal team are now beginning to focus in on this point. And who knows, I still have a tiny little piece of faith in the British justice system. At the very least, I'd rather face a British judge than a British minister or a British newspaper editor, or a member of Britain's political class, uh, there is some, if there is still some honor in the British judiciary, uh, that line of defense might prevail. But on the other hand, the judge said just this week uh, that the government is very keen to have this case disposed of promptly and within the allotted time, uh, thus revealing to the world that the notion that the British judiciary and the British government are two entirely distinct and separate institutions uh, was not quite as we are told in the textbooks uh, that it is. Because of course the government has nothing to do with this. The government is prosecuting the case, but it has absolutely no authority on what the time scale of this should be, let alone on what its outcome uh, should be. At least that's what the textbooks and constitution uh, tells us. Uh, Julian's crime, as everybody watching this knows, is to uh, expose high crimes and misdemeanors amongst the powerful. And the powerful have made it a crime for people like Julian to tell the truth about their crimes. And that takes us into a very, very, very dark place uh, that I don't need to spell out. If this is what happens to you, if you are a Julian Assange, there'll be fewer, maybe none, amongst the publishing and journalistic fraternity who are ready to be Julian Assange in the funeral, in the future. Yeah, you know, it's funny because we always hear about, um, you know, how terrible these other countries are, China and Russia, because they repress journalists. And then we exemplify press freedom by locking up Julian Assange. So, uh, you know, along with Chelsea Manning and... Uh, Double standards are us. 
Don't forget Chelsea Manning. Too many people uh, forget Chelsea Manning. She is a real hero. And I'm wondering, where are all the pussy hats? Where are all the liberals? Where are all these intersectional feminists? Where are the people fighting for gay rights, for transsexual rights? Why don't they care that Chelsea Manning is being crucified right now in an American prison? Why aren't they protesting about that? Well, we also had the instance uh, this past summer where um, people were lifting up this uh, Ukraine gate uh, whistleblower. Meanwhile, you have all of these whistleblowers being oppressed, uh, you know, Edward Snowden included. included. Um, so something else I wanted to ask you about today um, was uh, the uh, Jeffrey Epstein case. As you know, there were some very strange circumstances around Jeffrey Epstein's suicide. I know it's come up a few times that Jeffrey Epstein, you know, among all of the connections that he had with U.S. politicians and celebrities and all of these huge figures, he also has ties to the uh, British royal family and also Prince Andrew. I'm just wondering, uh, has there been any movement on this case in the U.K.? Is there any possibility that Prince Andrew, um, you know, may be prosecuted or that there may just be any sort of investigations into the British royal family? No, he can't be prosecuted here uh, because uh, our uh, legal system is headed by his mother. Uh, so you'll never get a, a, a criminal case of Elizabeth R versus uh, Andrew, uh, who is, I think, her uh, second son or third son. Most people say her favorite son. So he will never uh, be prosecuted here. He might be prosecuted in the United States. Uh, but he certainly should be in the United States answering uh, the FBI's questions, if indeed the FBI have any questions. Uh, my question about the FBI is why haven't they located Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, who it's abundantly clear uh, was effectively the pimp of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And uh, if they're not looking for her, they're not going to be looking for Prince Andrew. I have a particular interest in this case because I was the man in Parliament under parliamentary privilege who began the process, it was quite a short one, of bringing down her late father, Robert Maxwell, the Israel agent and British uh, publisher who turned out to be the greatest British thief of the 20th century. He uh, stole hundreds of millions of pounds of his own employees' pension money. And I played uh, a, a pretty significant role in, in bringing him down. Uh, his favorite child was Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, and indeed, the yacht from which or on which, depending on your theory, uh, he met his end was called the Lady Ghislaine. Um, and because of his close relationship to intelligence, at the very least Israeli intelligence, but there may have been others, uh, I've long suspected that the Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein affair had its roots not in the unspeakable sexual depravity that they represent, but in the unspeakable <laughs> depravity of the intelligence business. Uh, it seems to me overwhelmingly likely that Maxwell and Epstein were uh, luring people into this depravity in order to photograph and film and record them uh, so as to exercise through blackmail uh, that kind of uh, power over them. That seems to me at least the best working hypothesis. And in a way, I'm surprised that not many more people in the United States are clamoring for that to be dealt with. Of course, if that is the case, that would explain the lack of action on the part of the FBI and the justice authorities. But Epstein and Maxwell were uh, close friends of former presidents of the United States, would-be presidents of the United States, former and maybe would be prime ministers of Israel, as well as rich and powerful people from all over the world. And it seems abundantly clear uh, that uh, 
when they entered the halls of Jeffrey Epstein, they were entering uh, the gates, if not of hell, then, then of the ante rooms to hell. So, George, I know we don't have much time left. I did just want to read you a couple of questions from my patrons. Uh, Primo Nutmeg patrons who support the show on Patreon uh, can submit questions to guests. So I just had a couple here. Um, one said, I've heard lots of people here in the in the States compare the motivation of Brexit supporters with that of Trump build the wall supporters. But it seems to me that while there seems to be an element of truth to that take, there's also a lot of common ground, particularly from the left with opponents of trade deals like TPP and TTIP. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, it's a good question, and both of those are uh, true uh, up to a point. Uh, the question of uh, Britain, small island, uh, being subject to literally, uh, well, not literally, because I suppose the limit would be the membership or the population of the EU, but we could have, in theory, had 400 million people come from the EU and come and live, work in Britain without a buy your leave, without a passport shown, without a, a, a visa required, without a work permit required. Now, of course, we didn't get 350 or 400 million people, but we did get many millions of people. And those millions were people who were coming from low-wage economies to our, relative to theirs, high-wage economy. Uh, so a worker in Bulgaria, for example, uh, has a national minimum wage of one pound per hour, uh, whereas if he earned seven pounds uh, in Britain at the minimum wage, he was fantastically increasing his own personal standard of life. But for the working class that were already here, wherever they came from, whatever color they are, this represented a downward pressure on wages. You don't have to be uh, Galbraith to work that out. The simple economics, uh, an increase in the supply of labor in the absence of a strong trade union movement or a government prepared to legislate to stop it can only lead to a depression in wages. And that, of course, is what it did lead to. Many millions of mainly single men uh, coming into the country, of course, puts an upward pressure on rents uh, because uh, these uh, workers are coming in for a short, medium or long time, uh, but they don't have homes or families here. So they are renting in the private rented sector. And thus, uh, again, you don't have to be an economist to work it out. A very large number of people chasing a scarce uh, number of housing units drives the price of those housing units in the rented sector up. Thirdly, uh, a significant number of people, millions of people coming into the country in the absence of public services, can only lead to increased pressure on already decimated public services. So you've got four and a half, five million new people, uh, but your school, your doctor's appointment possibilities have not improved, your hospital is not being replaced, rebuilt, expanded, uh, and all the other public services. So there is a bit of the build the wall uh, involved. There's no need to be ashamed of that, by the way. Every country has a border. And if you have a border, well, you have to defend that border or there's no point in having the border. And if you don't have a border, you're not actually a state. And it's a mistake for left-wing people to be identified with the idea that absolutely anyone can come. There's nothing leftist about that, neither for the workers that are already here, nor the working people in the countries that the poor immigrants have come from. Because, of course, it, it beheads them. Uh, the, the men leave, the hardest working people leave, the smartest people leave, and they leave their own countries weaker uh, than they were before they left. That is a proper leftist uh, 
analysis of mass immigration. There's nothing left wing about mass immigration at all. But the second part of your Patreon question is also true, uh, that TTIP, NAFTA, the Maastricht, post-Maastricht Treaty EU are all things that run out of the same stable. When we finished shipping in cheap East European labour to work in our workplace under the EU's rule, we started shipping our trees out of Britain into Eastern Europe. The cheap labour was coming here and depressing wages. Meanwhile, many of the factories themselves were, in some cases, literally unbolted from the floor and shipped to Eastern Europe uh, to take further advantage of the low standards, low regulation, and above all, perhaps, low wages there. So the reason why Brexit is analogous to Michigan voting for Donald Trump is because the workers in Michigan saw their place being de-industrialized in the name of neoliberal economics. And this cost them not just their jobs, not just their incomes, but their status, uh, their self-esteem. Here we were, blue-collar workers who used to make things, and now, thanks to NAFTA, we are robbed of that ability. This sets moving dynamics inside the family, inside the society as a whole, that are deeply damaging uh, to uh, social and personal and human relations. That happened in Michigan and other places in the US. It happened in the Midlands and the north of England and South Wales, uh, where uh, people voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. So your Patreon questioner is definitely on to something on both those points. So the uh, other one actually isn't a question. It's just a message to you. Uh, William Pounds writes, you warned Jeremy Corbyn and he didn't listen. Jeremy shot himself in the foot on several fronts. Crazy how accusations of anti-Semitism can ruin a career. They did it to Cynthia McKinney, and it seems they're attempting to try with Bernie. Anyway, I look forward to Mr. Giles getting back to me about the joint podcast with you, Cynthia, and I. Regards, Mr. Galloway. So, um, so yeah, uh, George, I really do appreciate you being on the show today. I just had one last quick question um, because, you know, we're moving into a new decade now with the 2020s. And, um, you know, the, the struggle that you've been fighting for years and years is continuing. But I'm just wondering if you can maybe describe how you see the nature of that struggle. Is it nationalism versus globalism? Is it capitalism versus socialism? Is it theocracy versus secularism? Just what is the nature of the struggle as we move into this new decade? Uh, nationalism exists. It is in part a recoil uh, from the price of globalism, the price of globalization. I personally am not nationalistic, uh, neither Scottish nationalist nor British nationalist. The only country I ever felt my own uh, no longer exists. So uh, I have no national feeling at all. But I do believe in the nation state because I believe that the nation state is the optimal vehicle that we currently have of shaping people's lives for the better, of acting as a counter to otherwise hegemonic global economic and political forces. Not because I'm a nationalist, but because I'm a Democrat that people should democratically be to at least in part control their own destinies and the nation state provided that nation state is big enough and Britain is big enough 65 million of us we are big enough to provide that counterweight to the otherwise hegemonic economic power of capitalism but I'm a socialist because I believe 
that capitalism, which was a necessary epoch, has reached the end of its useful life. It still has a life, uh, but it's not a useful life, neither for the millions who have to live under it, nor for its historic role in further developing uh, productive power, economic and productive power uh, in society. I believe that we have reached a stage where it would be better uh, if we had an economy which was not beholden to the whims of the 1% of the billionaires who make logical decisions, but logical to their own interests. We need a state which has a guiding hand in the economy, which is thinking and acting logically in the interests of everyone, not just in the interests of the owners of capital. So socialism or barbarism, uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, famous dichotomy almost exactly 100 years ago. That's still the question so far as I'm concerned. Well, George Galloway, I really do appreciate you being on this episode of Primo Nutmeg. For folks out there who would like to follow you and stay up to date with all of, uh, the latest news and also with the Workers' Party of Britain, how can they do that? Well, the best way is the fastest way, I suppose, <clears throat> is on Twitter. So I've got a blue tick, at George Galloway. The Workers' Party uh, doesn't have a blue tick yet, but it has a beautiful mod, red, white and blue roundel, and it's Workers' Party GB. Uh, but you can follow me, of course, in everything I do on my website, georgegalloway.com. It's been a pleasure talking to you all. Thanks very much indeed for inviting me. Yes, thank you very much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, This could be the, uh, the last interview of the decade for me, so it was really an honor to have you on, and hopefully we can have you back at some point in the future. Of course. Thank you very much indeed.